One of the best sermons I have ever heard in my life about baptism uh, was preached by a man named Rex Boyles, one of the most powerful preachers I have ever heard in my life. <clears throat> uh, he's the one that wrote the Mark study that uh, so many of us love, and our lives have been changed by it. And he, with that passage right there, with the Ethiopian unch, that's the way he always said it, the unch, just to kind of mess with our heads a little bit, the eunuch. He said, think about the way that we ask the same questions today uh, rather than uh, in, in, as opposed to how the Ethiopian man asked the questions. So many people today ask, why do I have to be baptized instead of what keeps me from being baptized or why can't I be baptized? Showing the desire there, not the now you're really going to have to convince me to do what God wants. You see, the mentality of that man is just beautiful and that's what the Word of God can do for a person. In 1975, I made a phone call on my, the, the, the phone of my parents um, in their kitchen and it was a rotary phone, you know, mm, mm, mm. Uh, and I called my mentor, my father in the faith, Charles Saxton, and I said, Charles, I'm ready to become a disciple of Jesus. Those were my words. I knew what that meant. I was taught very well in the fifth grade by Sister Brown, the preacher's wife, and Sister Donahue in the sixth grade, and I had... Jerry and his brother Johnny Stevens in early junior high school. And these men and women taught us the word. Open Bibles, pencils in hands, marking up, taking notes. And, and it was a boot camp. It was incredible. But it changed my life. And that next day, I was sick to my stomach. I was so nervous. I was pathologically shy in those days. Can you believe that? Just, just, you just look at me cross-eyed and I'd probably run away and cry. And I summoned all my strength and I walked down that aisle. And uh, my, my uh, father in the faith immersed me into Christ for the forgiveness of my sins so that I could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I will never forget the first time after that moment that I sinned. It tore me up. It absolutely just just tore me up that so soon, so soon did Satan jump back in my life and mess with my head and tempt me to, I don't even know what it was now, I don't remember what it was, but it hurt my feelings because I felt I hurt his feelings, the Lord's feelings, uh, when I sinned. But in the 40 years since then, I've learned so much more about what it's meant simply by the word, yeah, but by living the life and living out the first words I said to Charles, which was, I want to be a disciple, a disciple, because that is what it is all about. Today, I want you to consider, think about your baptism. Now, certainly, if you have never been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, you certainly do need to consider that, and I pray that you will uh, as we go through this lesson. But if you have ever, and if, but if you have been baptized, I want you still to consider your baptism. Because if you have ever questioned it, if it has ever nagged at you, and if you have ever wondered and asked the myriad of questions that a person can ask post-baptism, that so many people yours truly included, have wandered through the years. I want you to listen and to hear and to study and to wrestle, okay, uh, with it this morning too. In my ministry, I have encountered so many people uh, who struggle in their life and they struggle with their faith and they struggle with the feeling of security in their relationship with God. And in those struggles, the vast majority, now, I, 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 this is anecdotal, but, but I'm, I know I'm right in this. The vast majority of the people that I've talked to that have struggled in all these areas, the, uh, the, the one thing that they have in common, the majority of them, is they struggle with their baptism. 
Was it right? Was it biblical? Was it real? Uh, a few years ago, baptized someone in that tank right there. And only later did this person tell me, I hate to tell you this, but I was very disappointed when I was baptized. And I'm just, what? I mean, I wanted to cry that, that this person would say that. He says, why did I think it was gonna, everything was going to instantly change and be perfect in my life? Well, I wanted to say, and I didn't say it. Well, you didn't hear that from me, trying to justify myself. Oh, uh, but, uh, yeah, that was my fault on that one, I think. But that's what he was thinking. It, it just, there was no fireworks. There were no angels singing. There was, there was applause, you know, yours. That was nice. But he struggled there. It wasn't the way I thought it should be or thought it would be. People ask questions uh, in this regard to me all the time. Am I saved? I don't feel saved. Or I still struggle just like I did before I was baptized. So it's kind of like, so what's the difference? What's the point? Do I really have the Spirit in me? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then they go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, and they start reading off those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all nine of them. And then they wonder, I don't got any of that, or very little. And they want to know why. I have, the, the, here's one. I have no idea why I was baptized. No idea at all. I look back and thinking, they, they said do it and I did it. Or I got pressured by my parents. Or the, the preacher was hounding me, knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell. My goal today is simply to get you to think about the most important event that can ever happen in your life. On the day that your sins are washed away, that the day that God's grace and your faith are connected and you receive that blessing of eternal life when you are immersed into the name of His Son. That, that day, that event, that ceremony is life and eternity changing. That's what it's meant to be. Now, I want you to consider certain passages and teachings that I hope will help you understand what the Bible teaches about baptism and understand that it is a vital salvation matter that you do. And my friends, regardless of what anyone can tell you, baptism is a salvation matter. You can't read the New Testament in any other way. That's clear teaching. Now, there always seems to be controversy of surrounding baptism. I've never gotten that. Maybe it's because of our fellowship. I understand that. I mean, we're we're uh, you know pretty strong on this one, right? Uh, but it it seems to me that there's always controversy surrounding baptism. But but you know what's it's interesting that there was just as much controversy in the first century about baptism as there is today. It hasn't changed. You know, for instance, John the baptizer. John the Baptizer's, uh, his, uh, his, his baptism and his message was controversial in his day. It was controversial because it was for the forgiveness of sins based on the confession of sin and the repentance of sin, all in view of the Messiah coming. And so it was very controversial. He looked funny. He preached funny. He sounded and looked like an Old Testament prophet. So they were thinking, whoa, this could be the guy the Messiah, the, the prophet that was to come. But what, also, what it also did in controversy was that people, the regular folks like you and I, were obeying his gospel and they were baptized in the Jordan after repenting of their sins and, and, and what a blessing that was for them. But the spiritual leaders roundly, all of them, they denied his message and denied his baptism. Later, the text says they rejected God's purpose for them when they rejected John's baptism. Controversy. There you go. We have it today. Do you realize that Jesus, Jesus and His disciples baptized people? 
I mean, it was, that was controversy because it seemed like Jesus and John were in competition with one another. Jesus' baptism was controversial, I think, simply because so many people miss those two little verses in John chapter 4, verses 1, verse 2. I've heard so many people say, I never saw that before. That Jesus and his disciples baptized people? What? Well, I didn't write it. There it is. It's been there all along. What kind of Bible do you have anyway? There it is. Bigger in Dallas. How about that? Jesus had his disciples baptize believers to ready them for the coming kingdom. The Messiah was there. He was pointed out. He was uh, uh, working and, 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 and preaching and healing. And Jesus had his servants baptize people too. The apostles. The apostles' baptism was very controversy because of the people they dared to baptize. It wasn't just believing Jews, he baptized those nasty pagan Gentiles. That was a firestorm of controversy in that one. But it wasn't just the Gentiles being baptized uh, by Paul and Barnabas and Peter and, 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 and Philip and others. It was also the fact that in, when they baptized, that people that they were baptizing somehow thought the apostles were the ones they put their hope and faith in, not in Jesus. And Paul had to, put a, had to put a stop on that one. He had to squish that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said, listen, you know, the, the ones that baptize you are nothing. We didn't die for you. You're not my disciple. Jesus is your Lord. He was trying to convince them. That's where the controversy came from. Now, here's the thing. Jesus was so very clear about the importance of your immersion into his name and, into, uh, and, and for the forgiveness of sins. He was so clear on its importance. And that act of immersion in water, uh, that it means and how it is tied to salvation. Now, what, it, here, here's the irony of all this. Do you think that Jesus meant for something so simple and so beautiful as baptism, biblical baptism is, that we should see it as something to doubt or something to argue about or something to dismiss out of hand? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Now, now get this. Jesus himself was baptized as an example of doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And showed everybody what, what he is going to expect. He and John were, gonna, were going to make this happen so that they could see and they could know that he sh thinks it's important, that it is vital. Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13 says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. What is the right thing to do that is not right in the world, but right in the eyes of God? What is the right and proper thing to do for Jesus and for you and I? It's to be immersed. That's where it began. That's where Jesus' association with it that would spread through the apostles into the lost world. It begins there. Jesus was baptized as an example, saying, do the right thing. It's the proper and right and righteous thing to do. That's why. That's one good reason why. Second thing, Jesus commanded this baptism for the whole world. Immersion. For the whole world, Jesus said, Matthew 28, 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, what was the purpose there? John's was the repentance for forgiveness of sins have, uh, in view of repentance and, and confession in, in who Jesus, the identity of, of Jesus... What about this? It was for making disciples. 
saved people who serve as disciples. It changes their life. They repent and they are baptized. Everyone is to, it says, in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will, rec- or, and, and uh, hold on, let me go back. Let me do the right one in order here. Uh, when Jesus said, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you cannot be lost. It can't be. Because there is a life change. Part of what repentance is all about is a life change to be an obedient person living the life as a disciple, and having been immersed, you are going to live and obey and learn everything that Jesus commanded. Jesus commanded this baptism for the whole world. And then when the apostles, when it was their turn, their responsibility to to do what Jesus told them to do on that mountain, on that last day that Jesus was there, The apostles taught about baptism. They carried out the baptism. And the sinners, uh, first Jews, then the Gentiles and the Jews, they obeyed this teaching and they were immersed as well. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were convicted. Convicted about what? That Jesus was the Son of God. And number two conviction is they were sinful and they knew it. They needed it. It's not what, you know, do I have to? It's what must I do to be saved? They were ready to act in repentance and baptism in the name of Christ and having your sins forgiven. And then with that gift of the Spirit in your life, there's the life that we begin and then live for the rest of our life. The apostles then went from there. They wrote about it. They explained its necessity. They explained its uh, importance. They wrote letters to the churches. Paul wrote to the Romans about it. He wrote to the, to the, to the uh, Galatians about it. He, he, he wrote extensively about it. Peter wrote about it in his letters. Uh, John uh, preached. I mean, they all did. Why? Because Jesus went through it. Jesus commanded it. They were to implement it. They were to bring it to the whole world. Here's, what, here's one thing Paul wrote about it. Very important. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. About the, there are certain things in, in, in Christianity in our life as people of God, as these disciples, where we have to understand the, the unity of them how important they are. They're not everything rises up to the same level of importance in doctrine or in, or in the things that we teach, right? Or the way that we live. Some things are over the top, the most important things. Other things are important, but surely not as important as these. For instance, Paul writes, there is one body, the church, one church. There's controversy. I didn't write that. Spirit wrote that. There is one body. There is one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. What baptism is that? It's the one that Paul went through. It's the one that Peter preached and 3,000 did. It is simply to have your sins washed away and then receive forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Simple. There is one Lord. There is one faith. There is one baptism. There is one church. There is one spirit. There is only one hope that means anything. There is only one faith that we need to follow and one baptism to undergo. And that is what Jesus commanded. And so I want you to stop for a sec. It's already a lot. I want you to pray and consider about these inspired teachings. Because they're not given, you know, to argue about, to doubt, to, uh, you know, to uh, dismiss or, or whatever. It's simply clear Bible teaching. Um, they're in the notes, by the way. They're all, you always know where I'm going. Uh, think about those things. 
and pray about those things. Because God's grace and your obedient faith come to a point when you are immersed into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It is a salvation matter. It is the point by which that grace means something and that your faith is finally full to where you trust the Lord for salvation rather than how good you can be or how many rules you can follow. That's why it's so important. Now, I want you <clears throat> to allow me, if you will, to address a specific question that I get more than any other. And this is the question. If I had a dollar <laughs> for every time I've heard it, you would not have to pay me. Uh, but I still need that. But uh, Here is the question. Should I be baptized again? Controversy. Why? I don't know why it's controversial. It's how people feel. They want to know. They ask the question. They ask me. I tell them what I think, and I try to show them what the Word says. Should I be baptized again? Now, here's my answers, generally. The general answers I give. Number one, well, that depends. Well, that's not much of an answer, but it's the only one at first that I think I can pull out just to make them stop and just start to consider some things. That depends. Why do you ask? Then I always ask, what are you struggling with right now? And that's when the floodgates open up. And every issue from, you know, little kid all the way through or, or whatever it is, it, then it's going to come down. And I, just, I can just look at my watch. Tick, 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 tick. And that ends up in their baptism. I don't know why. I'm just saying that's my experience. I, I ask them, tell me about your baptism. Tell me about it. What were you thinking? What was going on? What was your intent? What were you taught? Do you remember what you were taught? What were you taught? Can you show me what you were taught? And then I ask the big question. What has your life been since your baptism? And bam, the floodgates open up and all the rest starts to pour out. What a mess on my sofa. People struggle with this. I have struggled with this personally, but also as one who wants to help people uh, to live a satisfying, full, and saved and confident life uh, in Christ with the, the, the full expectation that God's promises in salvation are true. And so the most important thing that you can ask uh, this is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach? I've broken it down into four situations that I've dealt with uh, and nuances of others, but, but, but these are the, the four main things that seem to be the bottom of, of, the, of the questions that I have been asked uh, through the years. Situation number one, they have been immersed for the forgiveness of their sins and they heard first the gospel message of salvation. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they knew they had to repent and turn their life to a godly direction, turn your back on the sinful life, turn your life to a righteous uh, mind, to a righteous life in Christ, confessing Jesus as Lord, and then you still struggle with sin. And you still struggle with those feelings of spiritual inadequacy. Here's my answer. Number one, welcome to reality. Welcome to reality in the life of a saved person. My friends, if you still struggle with sin and feelings of inadequacy, welcome to the club because it's by the struggles that make you doubt things that maybe you shouldn't doubt as much as you do. By those struggles, you are built in faith and you are made stronger if you allow them to have their full result. 1 John chapter 1. Strugglers don't necessarily have to be immersed again. They just have to keep on fighting the fight. 1 John, chapter 1. 
This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word has no place in our lives. My, fr- uh, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin... We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What I take from that, folks, is that strugglers and struggling is the way of life. This is what we're born into. This is the challenge that every one of us have, that we live day to day and struggle with our sins and want to be better men and women. We feel guilty and, you know, uh, if I had that, that proverbial dollar for every time someone said I, you, I stood on your toes or stomped on your foot or whatever, I would really be a rich guy because the Bible is convicting. It's supposed to be to help us grow in faith and grow in strength. What do you do? If you feel that way, after being biblically baptized, stay out of the darkness of the sinful world. Walk in the light of Christ's truth. Continually confess your sins. Tell the truth about yourself. And know that you have a defender in Jesus Christ. You're okay. You're going to be fine. Keep going. Fight. Don't give up. That's the worst thing you can ever do. Walk out of the light and walk away. Don't ever do that. Situation number two. It is true, my friends, that a person can love Jesus and believe in Him with all their heart and talk about Him all the time and not be saved. The Bible is filled with the passage. Filled. Uh, Let's read one. It's not in your notes. Uh, Matthew 7, I believe. Let me make sure. Matthew 7, 21. There it is. Matthew 7, 21. Listen to the words of the Son of God. These are the red words. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Okay, we can put that maybe in the top ten of the hard teachings of the Bible right there. It's true. It is totally possible to do lots of great things in the name of Jesus, call on Him all the time, praise His holy name, and not be saved. My friends, sometimes a believer who fully believes needs to be taught the truth of the word more thoroughly and way more accurately than they were taught so that they can obey the gospel message and obey the, the, the desire of the Lord and, and, and are baptized according to real knowledge, understanding what the word says, knowing why and knowing what for. Acts chapter 18 There are two examples of people that were immersed again. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. We'll start in verse 24. Acts 18, 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man. With a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. Stop there. What would we normally say? Leave that man alone. Don't mess up the good deal he's got. goes on. Though he only knew the baptism of John... 
He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. That's awesome. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to this learned man now, good preaching man, they explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, let me ask you something. He did it all right. He said he understood it all good. Well, what was the only thing that he was missing? The purpose and the intent of baptism. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that was necessary. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving there, he was a great help uh, to those who by the grace or by grace believed. And he started debating. I mean, that was the only thing in his life that needed to be changed, that needed correcting. Now, now, now look at verse 19. Or, or, or chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Do, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we had not even heard, even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, What baptized, or baptism did, did you receive? John's baptism, same baptism that, that Apollos had undergone. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then what did Paul do? He laid their hands on them. They don't even treat just the indwelling of the Spirit. They received the power of the Spirit by his laying on of hands. My friends, all I'm trying to show you here is that there are times when you need to look at the Scripture that to say, you know, about what I was taught, what was my mind like, what did I understand, uh, you know, was I correct in my understanding and, and taught accurately and thoroughly the, the word, the message about salvation, about the gospel, about Jesus, and about what baptism is all about. And they were baptized again. Situation three. Now it is true also that a person can love Jesus and look to Him for forgiveness of sins. And just, Jesus is my everything. But, not to be biblically baptized. It happens all the time. Biblically baptized. I mean of the Bible. Of the Bible. Now, biblical baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38, we've already read it. We've already established that fact. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Um, looking forward to, I mean, it is, it is a, a motion in the direction of forgiveness, not of forgiveness already given. It moves you to the forgiveness you need. The word baptize literally means to immerse. That's it. That's all it means. Immerse. In the first century, baptism was by immersion. As you had read to you about the Ethiopian man and Philip, they went down into that water and he immersed him in water. They got up out of the water and he went on his way rejoicing. Immersion. Biblical baptism is not pouring. It is not sprinkling at all. It is immersion. Why? Because it is meant to convey something that was done for you that Jesus was killed for you and was buried for you. And he rose to a new life for you, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And your baptism is a mirror image of that so that you know that you've been bought with a price, that you've been blessed, and you now have a new life. The old life is dead. The new life is to come. That brings us to the fourth, situ uh, fourth situation. What if a person is baptized? According to the biblical pattern we've been studying for, t for all these weeks now, but they never began their walk with Christ. There's a phrase for that. It's called dunk and run. Dunk and run. And then someone, not thinking too clearly, stands up on a Sunday night, you know, Brother Joe or, or Bob or whatever was baptized last night. Stand up and we can applaud you. Crickets, 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 because they're not here, you know. <laughs> they went on their way rejoicing. That's, that's all I can say. I want you to think about something. 
If a person is baptized according to the biblical pattern of teaching, but they never walk with Christ, what do you do? Romans chapter 6. We'll finish with this one. Romans 6. Never got the start. Biblical baptism. But the life never got going. There was no discipleship, no walking, no following Jesus. Listen to the words of the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul to the Roman Christians. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life goes a lot more, but that's enough. You know what's the operating phrase in that? Did you not know? Did your teacher skip that? Did you miss that? How I take this, my friends, is just simply with the fact that some Christians in Rome misunderstood that grace was not a permission to keep on sinning and that in baptism they didn't realize that they were given a new life to live and that their old life was supposed to die. It doesn't mean they needed to be rebaptized. It means start living the life. Start living the life. If you were baptized biblically, live the life. Get going. He doesn't ask them to be rebaptized. He says, live the life. What, is it, what does it entail? Accept Paul's explanation of what baptism meant. It is, the, it is the killing off of the old sinful life and the blessing of a new life. It is repenting and asking for forgiveness and then making the real changes to live right lives. And it is move on in the life of Christ. Start living the life of of a Christian. Get up and live your life. Finish what you started. Now what I've given you here very quickly, I just want to tell you that I will certainly give you one-on-one -on -one if you want me to. Because this is very important. And all you got to do is ask me. But I want you to know at this point, not all baptisms are the same. There is one baptism. Not all baptisms are biblical. I know that's true. But not all situations are the same either, right? Not all of them are the same. This is why knowing the Word and knowing what we are doing and why we are doing it is vital when it comes to salvation. So does that mean we need to be biblical scholars? No. It's not what I'm saying at all. But we do need to hear and accept the truth of the Word and that we know is true. Your baptism matters. My baptism absolutely matters. But where we're going to go starting next week is that your life after your baptism matters just as much. And we need to talk about that one. About the new creation. The old is gone, the new is coming. All this is from God. That's where we're going to be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time, thankful for your word. I pray, Father, that we will see it as you designed it and gave it, that we will be simple, humble people intent on doing what you want because it's all for our good. Father, it's not something to refuse. It is life when we're dead. Father, it will save our souls. I pray, Father, that by your grace, and that by our faith in your Son, that you will save our souls for eternity. That our faith in you and your Son will be borne out in believing the gospel with all our heart, the truth about Jesus, and the determination to turn to a better godly life, and then to have our sins washed away by immersion, to receive the gift of your Spirit, so that we can live the life every day until we're with you in heaven. Father, this isn't something ever to put off or something to deny or ignore or argue or be ugly about. It is something that you consider a free and wonderful gift 
So, Father, I pray that this morning and in the days to follow this morning, that there will be those who will accept that free gift of salvation given to them when they put their Lord on in baptism. So, Father, bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. You're invited to come as we stand and sing.